All right, let's do this. Um, hey everyone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, thank you so much for taking time today to be part of this virtual meetup. I'm Sid from the product marketing team at Statsig. Uh, and joining me today is Akeen, our product manager working on uh, the product analytics um, offering at Statsig. Um, I've been really excited for this one because we had a big launch um, of our product analytics tool last month. Uh, I think it was exactly about a month ago. Uh, but we've been building a lot of great capabilities around product analytics for a while now. Uh, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk a little bit about um, what we've been doing at Statsing, of course, but more importantly, why this matters and you know how you can unlock real value uh, by implementing product analytics in your organization. Um, so uh, as people trickle in, I just want to get a few housekeeping items out of the way. Um, the first is that we will be sharing the recording of this uh, webinar um, in a day or two, um, along with the slide deck. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, if you have any questions through the webinar, you can uh, you know, send them on the Q&A or the chat option on Zoom, and we will set some time aside at the end of this webinar to answer them live. Uh, we also have some resources that my colleague Morgan will share um, on the Zoom chat throughout the webinar. Um, things like being able to join our Slack community, um, some good reading material on Statsix product analytics, and a few other things. Um, and we keep, you can continue the conversation offline. Like I said, you can connect with Akeen uh, or me or the rest of the team on Slack. So, um, what we want to do in this session is talk more um, about product analytics and um, you know some general guidelines, best practices on what good product analytics looks like, how you can go about building a data-driven culture in your organization. Um, and then maybe just a quick overview of what we have at Statsig. Uh, but obviously, if you want to learn more about Statsig's capabilities and you know you want to schedule a demo or something like that, we obviously can continue that conversation um, after the webinar. Um, so with that said and done, um, thank you so much once again for joining us. Uh, we will uh, be asking Akeen, you know, six to eight questions um, around product analytics, and he's going to share a lot about um, based on his uh, years of experience working with with data as a PM. Um, and then maybe 10 or 15 minutes at the end, uh, we'll take your questions um, and have Akeen answer them live. All right, so um, with that said and done, um, thank you, uh, thank you, Akeen, for joining us today. Um, I want to uh, maybe just have you introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about um, you know, what you do at Statsig and a uh, little bit about your experience prior to that, and then we can get started with the questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Akeen. I am a product manager here at Statsig, uh, focusing primarily on product analytics, but also just thinking about like how we can build out a all-in-one platform um, so you can use data-driven decisions uh, throughout your product development uh, cycle. I've been here for about six months now. Uh, prior to that, I was at um, a small startup in town. Uh, before that, I was at Facebook for a few years uh, where I kind of like really um, kind of like grew as a product manager and like leveraging data uh, in all of the decisions I was making. Uh, and before that, I was at Microsoft for a bunch of years uh, working on things like Microsoft Teams, the Windows kernel uh, and Azure. Awesome. All right, so um, to get things started, um, a lot of you might know that Statsig was already known as a best-in-class experimentation platform. Um, so Akeen, can you talk a little bit about what was the thought process behind getting into the product analytics space um, and how this adds value for our customers? Um, because we, we officially launched product analytics last month, like I said earlier, but really we've been developing some of these features for almost a year now. Um, and it's been fascinating to see on one hand, companies like OpenAI adopting it alongside numerous hundreds of early stage startups, including those with just a handful of developers adopting product analytics and realizing value. Um, so my first question, Akeen, is like, why do you think product analytics has such a broad appeal and why did we build it 
at StatSig? Yeah, uh, so this is a good one. So the short answer is there's, it, it, it's kind of just easier to build a successful product when the whole product team uh, is empowered to make data-driven decisions, right? Uh, and it's also a lot easier when the tools that you use to make those decisions are just like designed to work together, right? So when you think about static, we have experimentation, we have feature flags, uh, we have product analytics, and we'll be launching new features that kind of like go with you along that entire journey. Um, so like you mentioned, Static was originally conceived as like a best in class experimentation co company. Um, and that's where we first found our like initial product market fit with folks. Um, and those are people who care deeply about experimentation. But what we also saw uh, was like a bunch of pain uh, when they were having to kind of, you know, take their experiment results and data and move it to a different tool for like further analysis um, or pipe in a bunch of data from a different tool, say like an amplitude or mix panel um, into Statsig. Uh, and it was just like really painful. And so we decided, hey, if we, with the way experimentation works is you kind of uh, release several variants of a feature uh, and then you see the effect that those different variants has on different on the metrics that you care about, and we already had those metrics. Uh, we're already doing analysis on those metrics. Um, people are already sending those events, and and we just wanted to kind of decrease the pain that people had with like managing uh, and maintaining kind of like data cleanliness. Um, and then on startups, uh, we saw an even bigger problem, right? So like startups are almost cartoonishly understaffed. Um, and they do way more uh, than there are like people or time to do those things, right? And so the most valuable resources that we see from a startup uh, are people's time, people's focus, kind of like the company's burn rate and the company's clock speed, right? So like how fast can that startup iterate, iterate, ship, get feedback, iterate again based on that feedback and data. Um, so we're in this really unique position to like one, solve the non-product problems, um, so bring the time spent shuffling and like continuously managing data between tools down to close to zero. Uh, we were able to help with the business problem of spending duplicate dollars on like five different tools. And then we were able also help able to help with the product problem of revving clock speed. So just making it easier to like make sense of the product data uh, and then getting the entire core product team um, working from the same tool and looking at the same ground truth. Uh, like we're a startup, uh, we kind of use these tools every day and we really believe in a world where like even small companies can make an outsized impact. Um, and we want to help companies ship more successful products. Uh, and I think we're just in a pretty unique position to do so. Yeah, no, I can definitely um, attest to that. You know, as someone who's on the marketing team, for me, it's been a game changer to be able to jump into Statsig, you know, create dashboards for some of the metrics that I care about as a product marketer. Um, and in that way, it has really democratized access to even non-technical people like myself to, you know, to see to see data, to derive insights, to have shared goals with the product team. Um, and I think I think that's that's truly a game changer. Um, and to summarize what, what what Akeen said is, you know, for large enterprises, they're able to unlock more value from their data. So obviously companies like, you know, OpenAI and uh, the likes, they saw a lot of value by, you know, having a consolidated platform. And of course, there is also the cost saving um, element of, you know, having just one platform instead of licensing out a feature flagging and experimentation and an analytics tool. Um, and then at the same time for startups, I think it's a great springboard to building a data-driven culture. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, today. Uh, but for startups, they can, they're able to start tracking events of interest. They can democratize access to insights, um, like I gave my own example, um, and also just build out that process to have you know, daily and weekly um, readouts. Um, but, but I think the term analytics itself is very broad. Um, every vendor out there has the word analytics on their website. I can I can confirm that because like as a marketer, when we're trying to do SEO, bidding for the word analytics is so difficult and is so pricey. So everyone out there is an analytics tool um, in some way is is what they claim. Um, so can you can you define Akeen like specifically what product analytics is and more importantly what it isn't? Yeah. So uh, I kind of, when I talk to my family about what 
my job is. They just hear the word analytics and I can watch their eyes kind of glaze over because they've heard it so many times in so many contexts. Um, it's a wildly overloaded term that can mean so much to so many different people. Um, but I think good product analytics is unique and it, and it does a few different things, right? So like it puts the users first, right? It's all about understanding your users, uh, but actually doing so at scale, right? So when you have 10 or 20 users, you could probably just talk to all of them, right? And like get a really good sense of like what matters to them, what their pains are and, and what's working well. Um, but when you start to scale into the hundreds, the thousands, the millions, um, being able to understand your like user's experience, your user's journeys, um, what they like, what they don't like, what resonates, are they getting value? Doing so at scale, you need tooling for that, right? But uh, different from like kind of business analytics tools or kind of like, like visualization tools that kind of focus on like the entire business, uh, product analytics is specifically very, very focused on users. Uh, second, it should lower barrier to entry to like make use of data, right? So um, analysis used to, I think, be squarely in the like realm of data scientists. Um, and that creates distance from like the rest of the product team and users, right? So uh, you want your engineers, you want your product managers, uh, you want your uh, designers all being able to like go and ask questions of data themselves and get really useful, insightful and meaningful answers. Um, and that also unblocks kind of the product team from needing to wait for a data scientist, but it also frees up data scientists to do things that like only they are capable of doing that like your product managers or your uh, engineers may not have like the expertise to go and do. Uh, and last, I would say um, it helps just build more successful products, right? So it should unlock insights. It should be easy to ask questions about your products and your users and get meaningful uh, answers back, right? It can confirm and disprove your hunches. It can help you monitor your product health uh, and it can help you focus your resources where they matter, right? So like getting insight to say, hey, this is what matters for users, this is how they're getting value um, and being able to like very, have you very narrowly um, kind of unlock value in the areas that matters most. Yeah. Um, to answer the second part of your question, like what it doesn't do, yeah. Uh, like, it, it, I think sometimes people have this misconception of product analytics is like a tool that'll just like spit out product strategy and like, um, that's just not going to happen, right? It's not going to develop your product strategy. It's not going to help you, or it's not going to come up with your next like great idea. Um, it's not a substitute for like talking to your customers and talking to them a lot. Uh, you have to have like great product sense. Uh, your designs have to just like be delightful, um, but it can make doing all of those things a lot easier, right? And help guide your direction um, so that you can focus on what you do best is which, which is like for PMs um, kind of really think about like strategy and, and uh, features that like will make uh, getting value out of their product easier. Uh, and for engineers, understanding the users, where are the hiccups, same for designers. Nice. Um, you obviously have experience working at, you know, big companies like Meta and Microsoft, uh, as well as with more, uh, you know, growth stage startups recently. Um, so I'm just curious to know, you know, how, what were your experiences like uh, as a PM in, you know, these different companies? Uh, and did you learn any lessons from those uh, uh, experiences? Uh, and and based on that, really, what, what do you define um, as a good data-driven culture? Yeah. So I started off at Microsoft as a PM in the kind of like mid-2010s. Um, and when I was there, I, I, I was on this team that was doing uh, monitoring for on-prem uh, like workloads and infrastructure. Uh, and we weren't really using a lot of data, right? Um, we were talking to our customers a lot. We were getting feedback from the companies that were buying up, but kind of like doing the deep analysis wasn't there. We were really, really relying on customer feedback and our own product sense. Um, then as I moved through Microsoft over to Microsoft Teams, uh, you, you could see like the shift that people were realizing like, hey, you're just leaving better product on the table when you're not using data. Uh, and it's hard to like talk to kind of like a bunch of end users at scale that at the scale that Microsoft Teams was leveraging or was at. Uh, and so we were starting to use data more there to like help guide our decisions, right? When I went over to Facebook or Meta, um, 
it was kind of a step function change, right? I was working on internal tools for developers at Facebook, right? So like my job was to help make Facebook developers the most productive uh, developers in the world, right? Um, and you could see that the kind of data obsessed culture that was that helped Facebook on the consumer side was just as kind of like carried over to the internal tools and products we were building there, right? Um, and and I think like one example of this that like really resonated with me was I was working on kind of a code review team. And while it was a pretty well-liked product in, in at Facebook, we knew that we were leaving like some stuff on the table and the hard part was figuring out why, right? So first we did a bunch of like data analysis to figure out, okay, or what are the things that like uh, in the product that aren't going so smoothly? And we kind of zoned in on, um, the time it took to get your code reviewed. Uh, but what we were saying was when you looked at the median or the average, it actually wasn't that bad. Um, it was when you looked at the kind of like 80th, 90th percentile where it got three, four, five times worse. Um, and while generally like the 80th percentile seems like the long tail of the distribution, uh, that comes out to like one in five of the PRs that you're putting out taking several, several days to get reviewed, right? And so um, then we wanted to confirm like, or back up that data with more qualitative insights. We put out surveys and that did confirm that like the number one problem that people felt with the code review uh, tool was how long it took to get your kind of like PRs reviewed. Um, and then we tied that all together. We worked on some products to kind of uh, help that clock speed go a little bit faster. Um, and then before we launched it, we experimented, right? So we took the feature, uh, we launched it to about 6% of internal developers, and we were able to get statistically significant results that indicated, hey, like this feature has dropped our uh, median code review time down by like 20%, right? Um, and because we were able to kind of go through the whole process of kind of talking to customers, looking at the data, using the data to help us find like points of friction um, and then kind of making sure that the, the the thing that we built to help solve that problem that we found through the data was actually going to have an impact before we just rolled it out to everyone. Um, that's the kind of thing that was really, really powerful uh, and helped me decide to kind of like move over to Statsig uh, because democratizing that kind of um, power uh, is something that every uh, company can benefit from and it shouldn't just be at the Facebooks of the world, you know? Yeah, no, wow, that's so powerful that, I mean, you were able to go that deep into data, slice things by percentile, identify a problem, then use, you know, A-B testing experimentation to actually solve the problem. And also you're doing qualitative analyses, um, as you mentioned. Um, that sounds like such a robust, uh, you know, set of practices there. Um, and I mean, obviously you used words like data obsessed and, you know, we often highlight the advantages of integrating data into every decision and utilizing it continuously in our work. Uh, but I want to know if, can a data-driven culture ever be taken too far and can it ever become unhealthy? Uh, and do you think there are any pitfalls that we should be wary of? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, I, I think... It, it manifests and it can manifest in kind of two ways. Like one is just the gamified data culture, right? So people who are just trying to move a metric at any cost um, without one thinking of the long-term effects of, of, of kind of what the change might mean, um, not figuring out if it really aligns with like the overall company strategy um, and just not really building in like guardrail metrics, right? So um, if, if, I've I've had emails that have come through my inbox or get notifications, and it's weirdly always towards the end of the quarter or the, the half, uh, where you can tell that there's a PM at some company just trying to like juice some metrics they need for their you know performance review. Um, but what I, often ends up happening is I will hit unsubscribe and not get that newsletter anymore, or I will just turn off notifications or unsubscribe or delete that app uh, because. While the leading metric like uh, engagement might go up, it might tank some more important long-term metrics like retention uh, and, and have a net negative effect, right? 
And so that is like one example, just like kind of gamifying things and just trying to only caring about the metrics and not caring about the actual impact that might have, right? Uh, and I, I think the second way that this can manifest in a negative way is reducing your appetite for risk um, and kind of like using it as a substitute for genuine creativity, right? Um, I think the best product ideas like don't come from staring at data, right? They happen uh, when you're just kind of out on a walk or taking a shower or um, after doing some like unrelated reading, right? Um, but a lot of that like focus and knowing where to like apply that creativity comes from the data. Um, but some of the biggest like best ideas I've had weren't necessarily like, born of the data. Um, they were born of just kind of like really obsessive focus customers and like trying to like lean on my product sense and, and staying in, up to date with like trends and technology. Right. Um, but data helps me focus where I apply those efforts a lot. Yeah, no, that's, that's so interesting. And I mean, I think I def I have the answer now to why I have been getting notifications um, on my phone um, and uh, it's good to know that I'm contributing to someone's, you know, daily active or <laughs> weekly active users. Uh, but it's so true, right? That like if if I get spammed with these notifications, you know, like the the sort of novelty effect wears off, and then I'm just going to be annoyed the next time I see those um, notifications. Um, and I I also found that point on creativity really interesting because I remember reading recently about Netflix's um, approach to having their skip intro button. Um, if any of you have watched, um, you know, binge watched on Netflix, you'll notice that the you can skip the intro of the TV show that you're watching. Um, so you can directly move to, uh, you know, the good stuff. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, what might have been the thought process behind, and Netflix is obviously known to be like such a good, you know, product centric company. Um, they, that was such a delightful feature. And I believe it's one of their most, you know, used features now. And it, it delights people all the time. Um, but it's also, I'm sure, not so obvious as like, oh, we we had this great insight and, you know, we, and that's why we are shipping this delight, right? Like, yeah. 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 I, I think sometimes like your core strategy has to be like, keep your users happy, right? Like offer them delights. And while that might not show up in kind of like, very leading indicators, right? So like that might have tanked, you know, minutes watched or something like that, right? But it might also lead to a lot of um, lagging indicators such as like overall retention, right? So I'm more likely to stick with the product uh, if like it consistently delights me uh, and that like skip intro, you know, I, I like watching the intro the first, you know, couple episodes, but after that, like it's pretty static. Uh, I get what's going on and I don't have to watch that every time. And so that's just like those little delights that like add up. Yeah, they definitely do. Um, okay, so how do we get to a healthy data-driven culture? We talked a bit about, you know, the pitfalls to be wary of, uh, but can you share a framework that guides companies that are new to product analytics and new to data-driven decision-making on how they can step-by-step -step go about achieving this? Yeah, um, I think there's a misconception that like it's often all or nothing, right? Um, so, you know, either you're a big data-driven culture or like you're not using data at all, uh, where like the actual answer is the the biggest impact you can have is by doing the most basic things, right? So uh, if you can, you know, think about it as like crawl, walk, run, or kind of going from data aware to data informed to actually like data-driven. Um, and crawling or just like kind of being data informed in this scenario can look just like doing the basics, right? Just like capturing events, logging your metrics, having like a good sanitary um, kind of logging so that, you know, when you want to use, make use of this data later, you can. Uh, and this helps you do things like the basics, right? Just like how many people are using my product? Uh, what is just like my basic retention look like? If you have the most basic funnels, such as like, sign up to use right like how, how often is that converting um th that is kind of like some of the most basic things you could use stat sig and kind of get there in the first five ten minutes of using a product and you've unlocked a lot of value right a lot of what i do at work is kind of like look at those basic metrics right 
Um, then you get into kind of like the more um, involved things, right? And, and I think the biggest change here is that it's not just kind of setting up the analysis, it's kind of like building a culture around it, right? Um, so um, really defining what the value moment in your product is, um, building funnels for like the the, the, the most common paths to your uh, product um, and, and getting people to understand that like this is something that you can use to help make better decisions and like provide small optimizations, right? Um, and then there's kind of, the run, right? Uh, or like being really data driven, where you're kind of tying it all together, right? So you're talking to users, you're maybe analyzing survey responses and dividing them up by cohorts. Um, you're doing the same when you're doing your analysis, right? So uh, when you're in a product like Statsig, uh, doing things like segmentation analysis, defining cohorts for power users, etc., looking at user journeys, watching session replays, um, and kind of using all of that to gain insights about what an, an, the next great feature might look like. Um, and then once you have those like data-driven insights, working with your team to kind of like actually build product that capitalizes on those insights and then testing them through experiments, right? Uh, so not just because sometimes your great product idea is just wrong, right? Or it doesn't have the impact, like you're more biased towards your idea than the rest of the world is, right? Um, so actually testing them uh, before you ship them and, and actually understanding whether or not it will have the impact you had, right? Um, and, and I think that like once you can tie that all together and have the whole team aligned on, hey, we want to get some, we, we want to make sure that uh, we're actually making our decisions based on some qualitative data, some quantitative data, um, some just like sense, product sense, but like we're combining all of that signal to help make our our, our decisions um, and once to release something, measuring the success of that like release uh, and making sure that it actually have the impact that you intended, I think that is like signs of a good uh, and healthy data driven culture. Uh, yeah, I love that crawl, walk, and run. Um, I think that's like a good way to like go from zero to one to hundred, I guess. Um, and uh, I'm just sharing for our audience um, a case study that we did with. Um, uh, with, an, with a fashion uh, startup called Lam, and they basically use product analytics over the last 12 months as we started building out features to actually build a data-driven culture from the ground up. It was like the starting point for their crawl, walk, run journey. And they've scaled to about 3 million monthly active users now, and we're able to drive um, conversion rate, which is obviously uh, critical for an e-commerce company, by 75% over time. Right. So I think I think it's a great way to think about, hey, even if you're like a five or 10 or 15 member startup, product analytics can help you start logging those events of interest. Their CTO, in fact, on the call told me that, hey, if any time we realize like there's a gap in some data, we just go into Statsig, we log that event and now we are tracking it. And now everyone in the company can see that they can go towards that. Um, so I think it's like. I'm really excited by the crawl part, much as it seems like the most boring uh, part of the framework. But I think that that getting going from zero to one can be challenging. And um, I think product analytics um, can really help um, help a lot with that. Um, OK, so coming a little bit more into you know the, the tooling uh, that companies use to achieve some of the things that you discussed. Um, there are obviously a wide range of vendors out there. Uh, we already alluded to how everyone has the word analytics um, in their uh, website. Um, but I guess as someone is you know, uh, going about evaluating tools, um, can you share a little bit about what they should look for and you know, what are some concerns that uh, can creep up um, without realizing? Yeah, um, I think one of the chief ones that I think about is scalability, right? So we we want to be a tool that like fast growing startups use. Um, and the thing about fast growing startups is like when they grow, they grow fast. Uh, and uh, we've already seen folks coming to us saying like, hey, like we kind of like outgrew like the stack that we used when we were a five, 10 person company. Um, what does this product scale, right? And fortunately, um, we kind of were forced to solve the hard problem first. Um, and uh, 
build for folks like OpenAI. And, and so making sure that you're not gonna have to replatform in six months or a year, right, uh, is really important because data has gravity. It becomes a real big pain to kind of move data as you have more and more of it um, over from one vendor to a another. Um, and, and that can be like a way that you're kind of stuck in a place that you don't really wanna be. Um, I, I think the second is kind of making sure that you have good data truth, right? So if you are if you have like a um, data warehouse where kind of all your data lives um, and then you're piping over some data to somewhere else and then that's piping data over to another tool, uh, it's kind of like the whisper down the lane effect. Um, you might not end up with the true version of the data um, that you started off with, right? And so trying to reduce the number of times your data gets transcribed from tool to tool uh, is I think really important. Um, and it also helps the whole team ensure that like the the definition of this metric or event is the, the actual one uh, and make sure that everyone is working with the kind of ground truth. Um, the second is thinking about like who's going to be using the tool, right? So is it just for the developers that on your team? Is it just for the product managers? Is it just for designers and UX researchers, right? Um, you you want to make sure that you have the right tool for uh, the right set of team members, right? Because there are definitely like different tools that take different approaches to product analytics, right? So there are tools that um, are primarily for very non-technical audiences, right? And so it's kind of, you know, there's a lot of training wheels on it, but like you can do a lot without a, knowing a lot about how to go and do data analysis. And then there are tools that are on the ops end of the spectrum that were that are kind of um, developed for uh, data scientists, right? And so you're, if you don't know how to write great SQL um, or understand the in and outs of how tables are structured, uh, you're not going to really get a lot of value from that tool. Uh, and then there are tools on like in between those ends of the spectrum uh, where, you know, a, a large majority of your team can use it, uh, but you might be missing some things that specialize for data scientists or some things that are a little more complicated than uh, a, a non-technical member of the team could um, get a lot of value from. Um, and then the last thing is just like value, right? Um, you, you, you shouldn't be paying for a tool that doesn't provide more value than it costs. Um, and just making sure that like you're not stuck in, you know, uh, a huge long contract um, that isn't really valuable for you. Um, and then I guess lastly, it's just like really doing your homework and making sure like it has the feature set that you need um, and it can help you learn more about the tool over time, right? I don't think we all start out uh, as experts in product analytics um, and um, th the tool should help educate you uh, along the way. Yeah, so you need you you need to make sure that it has you know gives you the ROI. It has the feature set that you need. Um, it is it uh, data scientists should be able to like go in and do more complex analyses, but it has to also be easy for everyone else to be able to go and you know get value, uh, even if they're not technical. Um, you want something that is easy to use, even when you are maybe like a single solo developer or like five or 10 member team all the way to when you go to like, you know, hundreds of employees. So it kind of scales with you. Um, yeah. And at the same time, you want like, I guess, an end-to-end -end platform where um, you, you're not, you know, duplicating data, egressing data more than necessary, which obviously again adds to uh, complexity and cost as well. Um, so my, my final question for you, Akin, before maybe we can have you do like a quick, uh, you know, two minute walkthrough of um, what we've built at Statsig. Um, I want to ask for people who are, you know, just getting started with analytics and like looking to set up, uh, you know, some basic tracking. Um, what are some table stakes, user metrics and, and use cases um, that they should be, um, you know, doing if they aren't doing it? Yeah. yeah, so I'll, I'll go through this quickly, but I think the most important one is, when you ship a feature, uh, you should have a good definition of what success for that feature looks like uh, and be able to track that with your product analytics tool, right? So this probably looks like going from, hey, a user user product to, hey, this is the moment or action that 
uh, really um, indicates the success or value that the, the user is getting out of it. So like being able to define your value moments uh, and then being able to track how often those happen. Um, second is kind of defining your core and power users and your kind of like softer users um, and seeing what things they do differently, right? Um, so defining that can be something like, hey, my power users are people who come to the value moment twice as often as everyone else, right? Um, and then going and creating cohorts in your product or in your product analytics tool, um, and then doing analysis that compares them uh, against uh, your other cohorts of users, right? Second uh, or third, I think would be, especially for B2B companies uh, is group analytics, right? So when your analysis goes from, okay, what are individual users doing to what are these companies as a whole doing? Um, and being able to kind of group on the like company ID or like domain um, that, that folks are coming from versus just the individual user ID. Um, last or next to last is probably like segmentation and behavioral core analysis. I kind of alluded to that, but being able to see uh, different segments and how they behave and how different shared properties uh, leads to different um product outcomes uh, and being able to do analysis on that. Um, and then uh, last is kind of once you launch a feature or experiment, um, doing some long-term analysis of how that impacts. So right when you go and launch feature or um, kind of roll an experiment variant out to 100%, uh, you might see a quick bump. Um, but making sure that that actually holds up over time to understand if it's truly a net positive or not. Nice. Uh, I think those are so relatable and like a good generalizable set of uh, capabilities that, you know, companies can benchmark and see like, oh, are we able to do some of those things now? And if not, it's probably um, an, an indication that you need to like, you know, upgrade your tooling. Um, I, I, I can even think about my own experiences from the past. I remember when I was doing an internship at Adobe uh, during my um, business school, um, it was it was actually given the scale of the company it was actually not that easy to like pull out some of this data like being able to define some of those value moments or you know check things uh, at the user level or at the group or company level um and this was for creative cloud which is you know a suite of 20 plus apps like photoshop and premiere pro and the like and it was actually pretty challenging to you know isolate the information that you need. And there was a lot of data science blockers. And um, it almost seems like, um, you know, it, things have also evolved a lot in the last two, three years, where like today you have a lot more powerful tooling from vendors that can solve for some of these things. So hopefully our audience is able to resonate with some of these, you know, features and and use cases that that Akeen shared. Um, and, and, you know, a good, good frame of uh, uh, to have is to see if, can we do those things today? And what can we unlock if we are able to now start doing those things? Yeah. Um, and on that note, um, you know, I want, uh, I encourage our audience to like, you know, ask your questions on uh, the chat or Q&A. Um, and Akeem, if, if you could, you could just do a quick two minute overview of, you know, what we've been building at Statsig to solve some of these product analytics challenges that we discussed today. Um, and maybe if you can briefly touch upon also how you as a PM use Statsig um, in your day-to-day, -day, that would be uh, that would be awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna share my screen really quickly. Cool. So yeah, so this is what the Statsig console looks like. Uh, you can see it's kind of divided into a few different areas, right? Our future gates are experience, and lastly, our uh, analytics. Uh, this is the main surface for analytics. Uh, we call this metric explorer and we have a bunch of different chart types. We have metric drawdown charts. So that's where you're doing a lot of your segmentation analysis or tension to understand how often users are coming back to the product funnels, uh, to track conversion through a flow distribution to help understand things like frequency. Um, and then user journeys to understand like the many paths that, um, uh, users can take through your, your product. So this is our demo app out, and in this, I'm comparing, looking at the average value of a purchase uh, and seeing that how that compares for power users, who I've defined as folks who 
uh, purchase at least twice in the last 30 days versus core users, uh, which are purchased, people who purchase at most once in the last 30 days, right? Uh, and we can see that over the last 90 days, um, the power users have tend to have bigger spikes in their purchase value. Um, next is kind of our funnels chart. Uh, and this helps you understand conversions, right? And the nice thing is that at Statsig, you can kind of break things down by um, a, a user property, right? So like, hey, how does it look like for Android versus iOS users? But if we wanted to, we could also do uh, group buys on experiments and feature gate groups, right? So, hey, how does one variant uh, of my experiment, experiment differ in uh, outcomes from uh, another version of my experiment? Uh, we also have the ability to kind of like look at how long it takes to convert through a funnel. Um, and then what does the change in conversion rate look like over time? Last thing I'll touch on is, or one of the last things I'll touch on are our dashboards, right? So sharing these types of analyses with the entire team, right? So not just looking at uh, kind of the, the charts that you do your analysis on, but also looking at things like experiments um, uh, and feature gates as well on the dashboard. Uh, and the last chart type I'll go into is user journeys, right? And so this helps you understand what does the path through the products look like for people after a certain event, right? So um, if I start viewing a, viewing a product in our demo uh, app, what are the next uh, steps that people generally take? You can think about this as an open-ended funnel where open-ended funnels where you have many paths that you can take and you can see the conversion rate um, for all of them. Nice. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for uh, you know walking us through that. Um, we're we're sort of like you know running um, like tight on time, so I just want to be able to answer a couple of questions from the audience uh, before we wrap up. Uh, and one question that I thought was interesting um, was from uh, was about can you still find value when an A/B test does not reach statistical significance? Um, and I think the question is getting to like so should you still be running some of these A/B tests? Um, and um, maybe you can just touch upon when answering this also, like how A-B testing and product analytics sort of like goes hand in hand. Um, yeah. So I think it depends on the intention of your A-B test, right? So sometimes you just want to make sure that uh, my new product or my new change doesn't tank things, right? Uh, so, hey, I'm running this A-B test and actually the good result is nothing is like obviously worse. Uh, and if you don't reach statistical significance, um, like that could be fine, right? Uh, I think it also depends on what stage your your company's in, right? So if you're in the very early uh, stages, you should expect that like the changes that you make are going to be like very significantly different from what was in the past because like you're building up this like solid foundation of features. Um, and so you should expect more outsized uh, outcomes and things like A-B tests versus like a later stage company where if you're tweaking where a button is or like a color or like small minor changes, um, you, you it, it might be normal that like those changes aren't gonna have huge statistically significant impact um, in outcomes that you're looking at. Yeah, I think I remember seeing just recently we were catching up with one of our customers who's just a, a solo developer who has a really great AI product. And he was able to like just change things like messaging on the sign up page to make it to make the value proposition uh, be communicated a lot more clearly. And the kind of uptick in metrics was like 20 or 30 um, percent. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's uh, that's awesome stuff. Um, one more question. And again, I think you may you may especially like this one. Um, uh, the question is, is session replay part of Statsig's future roadmap? And uh, do you have any approximate uh, timelines for that? Um, without spoiling too much, uh, very, very, very soon. <laughs> yes, literally, like stay tuned for, uh, <laughs> you know, um, on our LinkedIn, on our blogs. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's that's going to be like a really cool feature uh, that's going to, you know, bring some of the qualitative um, insights. Um, yeah. To answer it differently, I've been using session replay internally at Satsig, and I love it. <laughs> maybe, maybe if, if you could just uh, tell for those who may not know what session replay is, maybe just talk about yeah. like 
why this was brought up by um, someone in the context of product analytics. Like how yeah. does it... Uh... So, so session replays are a really good way from going to, from going from what's happening, right? So, hey, the, this group of people didn't convert in this funnel to why, right? So being able to like actually watch reconstructed um, sessions that people have had uh, and get that qualitative insight. So, oh, may, they, they they didn't convert from this funnel because they couldn't find the button or, right? They didn't convert this funnel because we gave them a notification. It distracted them, right? So uh, it, it, it really helps gain qualitative, um, interactive, immersive insight uh, on how people are going through your product instead of just kind of like looking at numbers. And it's a great combination um, with uh, product analytics, especially things like funnels uh, and our segmentation charts. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much uh, for asking that. That was like such an opportune moment, really. Um, and stay tuned, as Akeen said. Um, we should have some some exciting stuff coming very soon. Um, and on that note, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I think we've hit all the questions we got, um, either answered them on the chat or live. Um, you can continue the conversation with us on our Slack community. Um, so my colleague Morgan has has just sent that again on the chat. So do join the Slack community. It takes only a minute and you can directly reach out to Akeen um, and have your questions about product analytics answered. And not just that, but you get to engage with thousands of you know, data and product professionals like yourself. So be part of that community. We also do a lot of these um, events, um, you know, like today's meetup or product demos and that sort of thing. So the the, the Slack community is a great way to stay on top of what's cooking. And of course, like product announcements as well um, will be posted there. So uh, do take advantage of this resource. Um, other than that, um, thank you so much for joining us today um, and do stay in touch.